What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We are wrapping up my top sleepers for early, early, early off season. It's April 3rd right now. I did my top five last week. I told you I was gonna hit you with another five. These are the guys I really like where their ADP is right now and I think you could take advantage of. If you missed that, I suggest you watch that first. I'll link it right there. I hope I pointed to the right side. It's crazy. I've been doing YouTube for like three years and I still forget which side they do the links on. We're hopping back into sleepers. And again, obviously there's no such thing as a sleeper nowadays with all this technology. I just mean guys who are super undervalued. Where they're getting picked is just not where I think they're going to rank. I think they're going to rank way better when all is said and done. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I will ask one thing. If you enjoy the video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And I highly suggest you subscribe to the newsletter, my Big Dogs newsletter, which uh, you can go to the website right here. Scroll down, put your info in. I will be emailing out one sleeper, one bust, and one tip or trick related to fantasy football from now throughout the entire summer. Only value, no spam, no promotions, nothing like that. So you'll get that straight to your email inbox if you go sign up on my website, bigdogsfantasy.com scroll down to the bottom put your info in and that's that so we're going to talk about my next group of five sleepers today and guys i think you should keep an eye on and look to be drafting earlier than their adp all right we bike First up on my list is Alex Collins, the running back out of Baltimore. Went beast mode on us last year. Getting picked 53rd overall, running back 23. He was the best running back in Baltimore last year, hands down. It wasn't even close. Like If you watched him play at all, if you turn the TV on at any point and he was running the ball, he basically went for like six yards every single... He's one of those guys who like averaged five yards and went for five yards every single time. He, was a, he looked like beast mode. He looked like a reincarnated rejuvenated, skittleful beast mode out there. Collins was an animal 2017. So we look at some of the numbers. The numbers, you know we like to crack down on the numbers here. He ran for 973 yards on 212 carries. That was the 11th most yards of any NFL running back last year, that 973. 4.6 yards per carry on those 212 carries. Fifth among NFL running backs with at least 135 carries. There were 34 running backs with at least 135 carries last year. Collins' yards per carry ranked fifth. Three yards after contact average. Average three, three yards after contact ranked seventh among those 35 running backs. He had 16 carries of 15 or more yards. Second in the NFL, ranked 10th in yards created, or yards created per carry, 1.78 yards created per carry, 10th in the NFL per player profile, lure, per player profile, lure. Great, great website. There was nothing that he ranked poorly in. He got volume and he produced super effectively with the volume. They were still hesitant to give him the ball. You know, they just would not commit to Collins for some one reason or another. They started the season three and four through week seven, right? Week eight is when they really started feeding Collins, when he became like the running back in Baltimore. And week eight was his first game with 15 or more touches. From that point on, the team finished six and three down the stretch. Collins averaged over 19 touches a game in that span. Collins also led the team Team in rushing touchdowns. He had six rushing touchdowns, but he only saw three goal line carries. We had Suck Allen see six goal line carries, but he still scored more than him. Collins is literally just 23 years old. The Seahawks drafted him in 2016 as like a late round pick. I think it was a seventh round pick or sixth round pick or something. Cut him after one year. Huge mistake. They are going to regret this. So looking into 2017, right? We have to look at the depth here. You have Danny Woodhead, gone, wrong, which could be huge because that opens up a lot of opportunity in the passing game. And that was obviously not one of Collins' strength coming into the season or throughout the season. But you see the numbers suggested that they trusted him more and more down the stretch. He had two or more catches in their last seven games. In all of their last seven games, he had two or more catches. So he was getting involved more and more in the passing game. And if you don't have a guy like Danny Woodhead there, you can expect that they put more of the load onto Alex Collins this year. Kenneth Dixon's return is probably what scares most people <coughs> most people away for Collins. I don't think that's a reasonable thing to be scared of. Dixon has literally done nothing in the NFL that would suggest he's going to be a, ba a breakout player. The only thing he's done is be the focal point of millions of breakout articles via fantasy football writers. So he joined the league two years ago. He's gotten suspended. He's gotten injured. Hasn't played that well. The list goes on of things that are not a reason why Kenneth Dixon would supplant Collins. Basically, Collins is one of those guys that passes the eye test with flying colors. And as soon as they gave him volume, he held up 
who was a beast. Uh, and I just think he he definitely is going to enter this year as their starting back, as their lead back. And there's no reason why, given his size, his skill, his the skill set that he can't manufacture as the back. And we know how often they use their, their backs as, as pass catching guys between Danny Woodhead last year, Suck Allen, and Collins himself got more work, uh, work down the stretch. Joe Flacco is one of those guys whose average depth of throw and average depth of target is always super low. He's always looking for those dump off passes. And I think with more opportunity, he doesn't even need to have that much more opportunity in the running game. Like 212 carries is a good amount to finish as an RB2. I think he finishes what? Finishes RB17 last year in fantasy, and that was like without a full workload. So give him a little more uh, rushing upside, more passing upside, and you're looking at someone who's going to finish as a top 15 running back, in my humble ass opinion. So Alex Collins the first guy on my list. Number two, boy out in LA. For the Rams, we got Cooper Cup. Cooper bring home the cup. Currently getting picked around 78 wide receiver 33. I honestly like both of the Rams receivers right now, depending on if they make any more moves in the offseason. Obviously, this will change if OBJ ends up going there. I like Coop and Woods out their current ADPs. I think it's like underrated how big of a beast Cup actually was last year. If you look at his rookie numbers, he led the Rams wide receivers in targets, receptions, and receiving yards, and he tied Woods with five receiving touchdowns. So he was the leader on a team that was top, th I think they were, I don't think they were the highest scoring team in the NFL. I think the, I think Philly might've been, but they were one of the highest scoring teams in the NFL and he was basically their wide receiver one. So, and you got to remember, right? It was a slow start in the beginning of the year for Cup in terms of volume, because they were trying to figure out the dynamic between Cup, Robert Woods, Sammy Watkins, like who should play where, how much volume is each person going to get? Are we even a fucking good team, right? So I think starting out, that was like a big slow point for Cup. And you look at the last six games of their season, including a playoff game versus Atlanta. He averaged 5.3 catches and 76 yards, scoring three times over the last six games. So that paces out to some very, very, very good numbers. That paces out to off the top of my head was that 85 catches um, and a lot of yards. Cup is a guy with great hands. We knew that coming in. He was always a really solid receiver, dynamite college production, beat very like top cornerbacks and elite cornerbacks in college. College. There was no reason. He was one of my favorite sleepers last year. I think if you look back at my wide receiver sleeper video, I actually had Cup. And this was early in the season, like before any of the hype was around him. So Cup was a guy I always liked. What intrigues me more than just his hands is his ability to move with the ball in his hands and the yards after catch, right? He plays from the slot often, which makes sense because his average depth of target was 9.7 last year, which ranked 70th among qualified wide receivers. 9.7 average depth of target. His yards per reception were 14. 14 yards per reception, 5.9 yards after the catch. What's that tell you? He moves well with the ball in his hands. We saw that plenty of times last year. The 5.9 yards after the catch ranked 10th in the NFL among qualified receivers. So, you know, he's a guy who even if he plays in the slot, doesn't mean he's just going to get dinged. He's not, he doesn't need to be a Jarvis Landry type who doesn't post any yards per reception, right? 14 yards per reception is a legitimate like wide receiver one average type number. So you have a guy who catches the ball all the time, plus can move with the ball in his hands. You're going to see a lot of catches, a lot of receptions, and a lot of yards. And a fun fact, Cup actually had the second most red zone targets among all wide receivers last year year. He had, I think, 24 of them. So yards, receptions, getting the targets near the end zone. This is like a trifecta for Cup to break out this year. The big news here is Sammy Watkins is gone. That opens up a ton for Cup. I know Watkins wasn't like a huge piece of their offense. 66 targets Watkins had last year. So it's not a huge total. But I, I think the key point to take away here is now everyone knows where they are in this offense, right? They know the dynamics of where each receiver is going to play. It's a second year in McVay's offense, which is dynamite. And now they're not battling for positions and targets and things like that. It's more of like a mental thing. And now Cup knows exactly where he stands. Goff knows exactly where he stands with Cup. More chemistry, I think, going to the second year cups gonna be a monster i'm the i'm i'm crowning myself the first person to say this hear it love it res respect it cooper cup is the white keenan allen in a couple years if not this year the third year he's gonna have some keenan allen type numbers I'm talking about 90 to 105 catches 1300 yards six to ten touchdowns he's gonna be the white keenan allen so you heard that shit here Fizzers. okay before we move on to the third sleeper. I want to take a minute to thank the sponsors for this video. Fantasyjocks.com. How you darn? Fantasyjocks.com, the number one leader in fantasy merchandise equipment. We're talking about belts. We're talking about rings. We're talking about trophies, draft boards for your live draft. So this is for any of you guys that play fantasy baseball as well. I'm sure we have an overlapping audience. They have all different trophies, rings, equipment, for your league, if you're interested, for football, these belts are the same ones you saw Stone Cold Steve Austin rock people in the face with back in the day. 
These are the highest level of quality that you're gonna you're, that you're gonna see from a fantasy football company. You can etch your team's names in, so you have the champion here every single year. Costs like five bucks to do that. Listen, you, you each throw in, you get your team together, you get your uh, your league together. Everyone throws in an extra ten bucks one time, and boom, you got this. You got this belt, right? You could do five dollars for the ring, and you can get one each year. That's what we do, right? Imagine chilling with your boys just to piss them off. You're wearing this ring. You wear it everywhere. I remember when my friend Nick won this belt two years ago. He literally wore this to the mall. He brought it out to the bar. If we went to get eat, at, like if we went to eat at a restaurant in our town, this thing was on his shoulder. And it wasn't even like I don't even think he was trying to show it off. I think it was more so to piss me off. So it worked. So definitely check out fantasyjocks.com if you're looking for any fantasy equipment. I promise you, it's super, super, super high quality. Um, you're not gonna find it anywhere else. So thank you to Fantasy Jocks. Also, if you're enjoying the video so far, scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up button. I'll wait. I'm serious. Scroll down. I ain't starting until you scroll down and hit the thumbs up button. Okay, that was enough time. We'll move to number three, and that is your boy. This is a guy that a lot of you guys guessed. Tariq Cohen running back out of Chicago, AKA the human joy stick. Getting picked around 85 to 90, running back 33. How the Bears found a way to not use Tariq Cohen in 2017 is literally unbelievable. He's an amazing, literally his, his, his nickname is the human joy stick. He's an incredible athlete. Hold on, let me close my window up. <sighs> okay, 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 okay. As I was saying, an unbelievable talent. Crazy athlete. Like, he's like one of the funnest players to play with in Madden, except he's like that in real life, too. The big thing here, of course, is the coaching change. John Fox's offense moved in slow-mo last year. Like, that was embarrassing if I was a Chicago fan. Now they have Matt Nagy coming in. He is the former OC, offense coordinator for the Chiefs. He comes in, takes over as the head coach. I expect him to turn this offense into a well-oiled machine, right? They sign Allen Robinson, they sign Trey Burton, another year of Trubisky, now he has some weapons on the side. Speaking of the NFL Combine, this is what Nagy had to say. Number one, size-wise, you see that and you say, okay, they're pretty similar, right, said Nagy. And then you have the speed, the shiftiness, the moves, everything that they do. They're similar in the fact that you can move them around and do different things. Guess who he's talking about? That was him comparing Tariq Cohen to Tyreek Hill. Remember, he was the OC of the Chiefs, so he used Tyreek Hill and he used him pretty damn successfully. Now you have a guy like Tariq Cohen. So you have a guy who used Tariq Hill super successfully, and now he's saying, wow, this guy reminds me a lot of him. Let's use him in the same way. Like John Fox thought it was good to run Tariq Cohen up the middle and give him four carries a game. Let's give Benny Cunningham more work than Tariq Cohen on passing downs. That shit was like, nothing made me angry. I didn't even really own Tariq Cohen last year, but the fact that John Fox played Benny Cunningham over Tariq Cohen, unbelievable on so many levels. It makes me angry just talking about it, to be honest. If you watch my video on uh, top free agents signings or my favorite free agent signings, which I'll link here, I talked about McKinnon and why I think he's such a good fit for the 49ers. And one of those reasons was when you look at good coaches in the NFL or coaches that are uh, adapting to the league, I should say, good at adapting, they utilize the running backs on first and second down in the passing game. Most coaches wait, right? They run, run, run. And they don't pass the ball to the running backs until it's like third down. San Francisco has one of the highest ratios of passing the ball on first and second down. That's because you have a guy like Kyle Shanahan. Here's what we're looking at. KC ranked top 10 in 2017 under Matt Nagy in percentage of passing plays on first and second down. Whereas Chicago ranked 25th. So expect Cohen to be utilized not only on early downs, but on all three downs. I really think they're gonna find a way to utilize both Cohen and Jordan Howard together. I'm really high on both guys. I would love to own both guys, right? Jordan Howard's going around pick like 28 or 30 right now, and I think that's insane. But Tariq Cohen, where he's going, Nagy's gonna know how to use him. And they're gonna use him simultaneously together. They're gonna use Cohen early on, on downs, like, uh, you know, Kareem Hunt was used all over the place on, on first and second downs last year, which is why he was such a big fantasy asset and caught a ton of balls. I think that's gonna be an underrated piece of it, is just being able to use him on early downs and not just waiting for third down to come. Now, the, the big downside of 2017, right from Cohen, was obviously his usage. Tariq Cohen saw double digit carries last year in three games. Guess what the Bears record was in, in, in those three games? You guessed it, you guessed it. Give yourselves a pat on the back, three and oh. 3-0 in games that Tariq Cohen saw double-digit carries. He averaged five yards per carry on those 38 carries in those three games. Problem is, Cohen had five carries or less in nine of 16 games last year. You've got to give a dynamic home run, crazy playmaking ability type of guy like that the ball in his hands. Because yes, there will be plays where he loses yards, but 
if you give him enough volume, even if it's eight to 12 touches, one or two of those plays are going to bust off and give you that 15, 20, 30, 40 yard touchdown type gain. When you have a guy like Tariq Cohen, you gotta get the ball in his hands. And no one understands that more than Nagy when you, when you played with a guy like Tariq Hill. Just think about it, right? Tariq Cohen racked up 725 total yards and he barely played on 35% of the team's offensive snaps. 35% of the team's snaps, 725 total yards between receiving and rushing. You have a guy like Duke Johnson who busted out last year, had a really big year fantasy-wise. He played on over 50% of the of the Browns snaps. You have guys like Theo Riddick, James White, who do much less statistically than Cohen did last year on much more snaps. So what I'm saying is like, give Cohen a chance. And he's gonna dance. Let the boy shake. Cohen is that, that dude this year. So Nagy will bring creativity to this offense that eluded John Fox. There's no doubt in my mind. He's just 22 years old. He's 20, turning 23 in July. I think Cohen takes a major step forward this year. Next up, Nelson Aguilar, the young boy out of Philly, wide receiver. I was blown away with him last year. I remember his rookie year back in 2015. I loved him coming out of USC. I remember you can go back and look at our live draft two years ago on my E-Town Get Down League. I think I took Nelson Aguilar like seventh round or eighth round maybe at the time. He was a first round pick for the Eagles. I took him in our fantasy draft like seventh or eighth round because I was so high on him. It took him a little while to turn into the guy, which was last year. I want to know how many of you guys watched Nelson Aguilar play last year and what you saw like when you saw him play. I'm going to do a comparison. I'm going to put this chart up on the screen and I want you to guess who these two players are. Probably not too difficult to guess. I'll give you a hint. Player X is Nelson Aguilar. I'll give you a kilo second to figure out who player Y is. That will be Alshon Jeffrey, his teammate. Going back to what I said before, right? How many of you guys watched Aguilar play in 2017? By pretty much any stretch of the imagination, he looked better than Alshon Jeffrey did. He actually looked, I thought a lot of the times he caught the balls, especially in the end zone, I was like, damn, Jeffrey looks good. And then I realized that was Nelson Aguilar, not Jeffrey, wrong. You're looking at this chart and you just see the numbers were so similar, yet Jeffrey was used way more but Aguilar's efficiency was much higher on basically every every level. Finished better than Jeffrey did last year. His yards per target were higher. His catch percentage was higher. Touchdown percentage was higher. Yards after the catch were higher. QB rating when targeted. Red zone targets was even used more than Alshon Jeffrey was last year, which is crazy. I think people are just waiting on the Alshon Jeffrey explosion year to happen now. And guess what? It already happened. It was five years ago, back in 2013. He had a huge monster year. I think it was like 1,400 yards. You're waiting five more years for it to happen again? Like, like, I just don't think it, it happens. He's 28 now, going to be turning 29, and Aguilar is turning 25 in May. So you look at the age difference and who is really on the come up. I know they gave him uh, this big contract extension, but by every number, the Eagles' number two wideout was more efficient, right? The only downfall was Jeffrey's 113 targets, which was 22 more than Aguilar's 91. What's funny is you look at those red zone targets, right? You look at the red zone targets, and Aguilar actually out-targeted him 18 to 17 in the area and nine to eight inside the 10 yard line. So when the quarterback, you know, when it's tight space and the quarterback needs to be more efficient, who did he target? He targeted Aguilar in those tight spots. And in the playoffs, right, Aguilar caught four tutties in those three games that they played. 15 receptions, four tutties in three games. He was that guy for them. And I've said it a few times and I'll say it again. And this is something, this is gonna be one of my themes kind of looking towards next year. Touchdowns fluctuate for receivers and mainly for receivers like tight ends and wide receivers. On a year-to-year -year basis, touchdowns fluctuate. The guys that depend on them for big fantasy finishes are very risky. You should look at Mike Evans, for example, right? He has two monster touchdown years, two really terrible touchdown years. That's going to kill you. If, you. if you use a top pick on a guy like Mike Evans or Alshon Jeffrey, for instance, those things are going to come back to hurt you. And you can look at Alshon Jeffrey's numbers right here. I looked at his touchdown per game. So it was like touchdown percentage, basically over the last five seasons. It's normally pretty high, right? His average comes out to 0.46, but last year was at 0.56. The year before that, 0.16. So that 0.56 is pretty high above his average. And I expect that to come down last year. Like those nine touchdowns were basically what kept him in fantasy relevance. His yards and, and receptions were very, 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 very low. So the guys who can catch the ball at a high rate plus make yards after they catch the ball are the guys that you want in fantasy, especially in PPR league. And that is Aguilar much more so than Jeffrey. If you look back again, like I said on the numbers, yards after catch, 5.1 for Aguilar, 3.5 for Jeffrey. Catch percentage, 68% for Aguilar. 50% for Jeffrey. So there's clearly something missing there in the efficiency column for Jeffrey. So the big variable here, I think, is Wentz sitting out for the basically the entire offseason program, right? He tore his ACL, 
but the Eagles strongly believe that he'll be ready for week one, and Aguilar will welcome him with open arms. You look at the splits with Aguilar playing with Wentz and playing without Wentz. As you can see, Aguilar played much better with Wentz in the lineup, but he wasn't terrible with Nick Foles. He wasn't terrible without Wentz. You look at Jeffrey, on the other hand, those numbers dipped Trey, Mon, Green dramatically. He was pretty much unusable down the stretch. Obviously, he played really well in the playoffs, right? But it took him much longer to gain chemistry with Foles, and that kind of tells me that chemistry is a big part of Alshon Jeffrey kind of succeeding and doing well in the offense. So we don't have Wentz for the entire summer. We don't know who's going to be the quarterback. That could affect things for him. What's scarier is Jeff Ron, uh, Jeff, Jeff Ron, Alshon, Jeff Ron, his off season. He is recovering from rotator cuff surgery that he had a few weeks ago. He's going to be out at least six months months. And Jeffrey is not exactly a picture perfect health kind of guy. So while Aguilar is getting better, working out, you know, gaining chemistry throughout the offseason, Jeffrey's going to be sitting on his arse recovering from his shoulder surgery. So if Jeffrey misses any time or even starts the year slow, Aguilar is going to take advantage right out of the gate. Them being 60 picks apart is just you know, absurd. You can give me Aguilar in any value, in any format at that value, 38 times out of 10. This is, I mean, I like Aguilar a lot where he's getting picked, but the fact that Jeffrey's going so far ahead of him is just kind of absurd in my opinion. All right, numero five, the last guy I have on this list, another Philly boy. I mean, give it up. They won the Super Bowl. They got some players. They got some players that play. Players play. Winners win. Gamers gain. There's a running back. His name is not Jay Jai. His name is Corey Clement. Getting picked 169. Ooh, nice. Running back 67. And I think Clement's going to be a guy who's probably going to get me in trouble this year. I'm probably going to try to own him in every league. I'm really happy. I took over a dynasty league this year, and Clement happens to be on the bottom of the roster. I'm like... Super pumped up about that. Not a monster year last year by any means, but he took a huge step forward in the fact that he beat out the depth chart, and then he started getting some serious play time down the stretch. And I think that's huge for his mojo going into 2018. You look at this kid. He's 23 years old, 5'10", 220. He is built like a featured back, right? He's built to take a workload. Finished with 321 rushing yards, 4.3 yards per carry, 123 receiving yards, so about 450 total yards, six total touchdowns. We look at how he finished the season, right? 100 receiving yards and a tutty in the Super Bowl. When it counted, when it mattered, who showed up? Your boy. Started playing a lot on third downs, and that was because he was very good at blocking. He ranked 13th highest in the NFL per PFF for pass blocking grade, per, you know, for running back. So that's a big reason why they kept him on third downs. He's also very capable of catching the ball. So that's great. And that could definitely translate into more touches, more, uh, more rushes. If he can impress on third downs and creep up into that, um, creep up into that spotlight. He was easily the most impressive rookie back on the roster. And I think both guys, Wendell Smallwood and Donnell Pumphrey are going to be on the roster bubble come this summer. Now, what intrigues me the most about Clement is that I think he is a combo of both standalone loan value and handcuff. Clearly the number two there, and he's clearly the handcuff to Jay Ajayi right now. If something happens to Ajayi, and he's definitely not like the perfect picture of health, right? Jay Ajayi, he's got those bad knees, could go down at any point. Clement will step in and be a 15 to 20 touch a game back, in my opinion. But I also think he has a lot of standalone value because we saw how well he played in the passing game, and I think he will get his eight to 12 touches a game to kind of give Jay Ajayi uh, a rest a little bit. And it's not like he can't handle it if, if Jay Ajayi goes down. Like I said, 5'10", 220. Look back at his uh, his college days. His senior year at Wisconsin, touched the ball 326 times, which is 25 times a game, and he held up just fine. The thing that scares me, obviously, and this is why I feel like I'm going to go down with the boat, like you guys are going to watch this, and then at the end, of, like next year, you're going to come back and be like, wow, Corey Clement was a shitty sleeper pick. There's a lot of rumors that are saying the Eagles are looking to invest in a running back in this year's draft. That's very true. Probably true. But if they don't do it within like the first three rounds, I don't think it's going to be a big hit on Clement. They've been working out. They worked out Darius Geis, which if they take him out of LSU, because he's my boy this year, he's probably my favorite rookie running back outside of Barkley, that's going to be a big hit to him because he's going to take a huge piece of that workload. So Geis scares me. They worked out NC State running back Naeem Hines, Mark Walton from Miami. So they're definitely looking at the position. Uh, we'll have to see, you know, who they get, where they pick them, because obviously the later the draft capital is, the less likely he's going to be able to beat out Clement. So that is my only big concern. Other than that, I love Clement as a late round pick. I love him as someone you could stash. And, and you know, he's not one of those guys you want to drop after one week because you're probably not expecting immediate production out of the back. But listen, let him, let him marinate on your bench a little bit. And by halfway through the season, something good could really come of Clement. I think he could be possibly a league winner. I don't want to I don't want to step out of bounds here. I don't want to be crazy. That's just how that's just how it is. Those are my next five sleepers. 
And um, and that's gonna wrap up the video. If you enjoyed, please scroll down a little bit, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you are new, we'll be hitting you with videos like this all summer and throughout the season. Again, go subscribe to the newsletter, bigdogsfantasy.com. Scroll down, you'll see a lead form at the bottom and you'll get one sleeper, one bust, one tip and or trick every single week straight to your inbox. That's it, go follow me on social, do all of that stuff. Check out fantasyjocks.com as well and I'll see y'all next episode.